All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope that you had a nice weekend. Let's go ahead and get started with hydraulic engineering. Um, the next assignment that you have due is pumps, and that assignment is due on Monday, March 8th, which is the same day that we have our first midterm exam. Uh, so the parameters of the exam are that it's going to be available on Blackboard for two hours. It's going to be open for our class period, and then also 30 minutes on either side. So 30 minutes before our class and 30 minutes after our class. Uh, although you have 120 minutes for the test, it's going to have the same length as a 50-minute exam would be from an ordinary semester, meaning that um, my goal would be for the vast majority of students to be able to finish the exam within 50 minutes. And some of the top students who work really quickly probably will finish the test in 20 or 25 minutes. Um, but then, of course, some people who aren't following the material as closely as they ought to or maybe who haven't completed the homework assignments you know, it's possible that for them no amount of time would feel like enough. Um, so it's a 50 minute test and you'll have well over uh, the 50 minutes to finish it. Um, it's going to be a PDF that's on Blackboard and so you can print it out or you can just uh, view it on the screen and uh, if you print it out then you can solve the exam on the paper that you print. If it's on the screen you can just use a blank piece of paper um, you can use as a reference your textbook, your class notes, uh, any previously solved assignments that you've worked on, but you shouldn't collaborate with any other person and you shouldn't uh, use the internet as a reference as you're working on the exam. So essentially I'm asking you that you not cheat on the test and if it's something that you know is wrong or that you're trying to hide then chances are you know it's something that you shouldn't be doing during an exam. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the test parameters a week from today. If you have any questions as you're preparing for the exam, feel free to reach out, you know, send me an email, call me on Teams, I'd be glad to help you. Today we're going to continue our discussion of pumps. And uh, pumps was introduced in the recorded class meeting that we had for Friday of last week. We're going to continue talking about that today. Um, this is a diagram that is illustrating the case that may cause cavitation. Um, cavitation is something that we talked about briefly in fluid mechanics last semester. And it's those small um, vapor bubbles that can form when the pressure of a fluid is very low. And so it happens before the pump um, or on the suction side of a pump's impeller. And so what this diagram is showing is, here's the pump, obviously, but there is a pipe that connects the pump to the water. And so this is a tank of water, and uh, here's the inlet to the pipe. It's got a strainer on the end, and the water is flowing through the pipe towards the pump. And uh, there are blades inside of the pump, impeller blades, that are spinning, that accelerate the fluid, and cause a pressure difference on the, uh, on the upstream versus the downstream side of the pump. And so now think about what is the pressure of the water as the water is flowing through this pipe. Um, here's the free surface. So this line right here is the boundary of water beneath and air above. So here is where the pressure is zero at the air-water interface. And if you go down through the fluid, the pressure is increasing. So now, at the strainer, the pressure is a little bit above atmospheric. Now, as we go through the pipe, the pressure is decreasing. And that's why the water is flowing in the direction it is, is the water moves from high pressure towards low pressure. So the pressure is zero at the same elevation as the water, roughly. And now, as the water continues to flow through the pipe, now the pressure is negative in gauge terms. It's not negative in absolute terms. You know, in absolute terms, we would have said that the pressure right here at the air-water interface is 101.325 kilopascals. You know, that's atmospheric pressure, or one atmosphere. 
So in absolute terms, as we are moving through the pipe, now the pressure is less than 101,325. And the pressure is getting lower and lower. In gauge, in gauge terms, the pressure is negative. But in absolute terms, the pressure is getting closer and closer to the vapor pressure of the liquid. And you may remember that vapor pressure is a property that is dependent on temperature. And that when you boil water, by adding heat, what you're doing is you're raising the vapor pressure to match the atmospheric pressure. The other way to get water to boil, meaning to go from the liquid phase to the vapor phase, besides heating the liquid, is by reducing the pressure that surrounds the liquid. And that's what's happening inside of this pipe. As we are decreasing the pressure, because of pipe friction, you know, that's why the pressure is going down, is as the water is going um, from the strainer towards the pump, the pressure is decreasing because of pipe friction. But then as it gets to the pump, suddenly there's a big increase in the pressure. It was negative in gauge terms, but the pump adds a sudden increase in pressure. And so those little vapor bubbles that had formed uh, either in the pipe leading to the pump or on the, um, on the impeller blades that's inside the pump, once they get to the high side of the pump, those, blade, those uh, vapor bubbles can collapse and send a shock wave through the water and uh, can cause pitting and damage to the impeller. So the rule is, is that if the absolute pressure of the liquid on the suction side falls below the vapor pressure, then the water will vaporize. And the reason why we worry about these little vapor bubbles inside of the pump is that when they collapse, it sends a shock wave through the water, and the uh, pressures can go up as high as 800 megapascals and localized velocities of up to 110 meters per second. So uh, that can really cause damage to the impellers. Here is a picture of pitting that has occurred on an impeller that was experiencing cavitation. And so it's not because it was uh, striking the bottom of the of the river or the ocean. It's not because it was uh, scoured with sand. It was simply just the water vapor bubbles that were collapsing um, when this was accelerating too quickly through the water. All right, so the way that we assess the risk of cavitation is by calculating what's called uh, NPSH, net positive suction head. And so the available, not net positive suction head is determined by the system parameters, meaning the length of the suction side pump, the elevation between the suction side pump and the water. So if we go back to this diagram, uh, some of the things that makes cavitation more likely is if you have a really long suction side hose. That increases the risk of cavitation because the longer the pipe, the greater down below um, zero pressure in gauge terms, the water is going to get. And if you have a small diameter pipe, that's another thing that can uh, tend toward cavitation, is because if the pipe is a small diameter, then that means that the velocity through the pipe is going to be higher. And if the velocity is high, then the rate of energy loss due to pipe friction is going to be larger. So small diameter pipe, risky. Long pipe, risky. The other thing that's risky is if you have a big elevation difference between the water surface and the pump itself. And so here, they've taken caution to make sure that the pump isn't elevated. What's risky is when you're trying to suck water up from a, a very low elevation to a higher elevation. So for instance, there are some places municipalities where rather than treating river water, they use wells and groundwater. You can't have the blades of the impeller at the ground and then just put the hose down into the aquifer and suck the water up. That won't work in most cases because the water's too deep and it would cause cavitation. Instead, what they'll do is they'll have the motor at the surface and then they'll have a very long shaft that goes down uh, below ground and then the shaft is spinning so that the impeller blades um, are at a lower elevation 
and there's less risk of cavitation. So here in this formula for NPSH, the way that you calculate it is you start just with the atmospheric pressure. This first term here, P naught divided by gamma, is the atmospheric pressure divided by the uh, unit weight of water. And now Z uh, sub S is the suction side elevation difference between the, uh, the water and the pump. H sub L is the head loss on the suction side of the pipe, so the pipe um, from when the water gets into it to the location of the pump, and you're accounting for both the friction losses and the local losses. And then finally, the last term is vapor pressure. And so one last risk that I didn't mention, it's pretty uncommon, but the warmer the water is, the greater the risk is that cavitation can occur. And most of the water that we deal with in civil engineering terms is um, you know, pretty close to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. It's water that's coming from underground, meaning groundwater, or pipes that are underground and you know the soil beneath the Earth's sur surface is a about 55 Fahrenheit. But if you're if you're pumping water from like a tank that's exposed to the sun and the water is warmer, then you can have an elevated risk of cavitation because the vapor pressure would be higher. And so all of these terms after the atmospheric head term. Um, increase the risk of cavitation. And so you'll m notice the minus sign there is you're calculating how much available head there is by all of these things that increase the risk of cavitation. So what the NPSH can tell you is how far the system is from cavitating and it, it will have units of length that comes out of this NPSH uh, available formula. Um, so here's the, the defined terms that I earlier have just mentioned to you. But you compare the available NPSH to what's required by the pump. And this is some information that you'd get from the pump manufacturer. And they can tell you for their particular impeller shape and for maybe the casing diameter of the pump and the speed that it is intended to be spinning at, uh, how much NPSH is required to avoid the risk of cavitation. And the required NPSH goes up as the flow rate increases and you can usually get that data from different charts that are provided by a pump manufacturer. And so if the required NPSH is greater than what's available, then cavitation occurs. I mean that's pretty straightforward. There's a certain amount of positive suction head that's needed to avoid cavitation and if you're giving the system less than what's required then that bad thing will happen. Cavitation will occur. Now when the two are equal, when the required and the available net positive suction head are the same, that's called the point of incipient cavitation. That means it's just barely about to begin. So that's kind of like as far as you want it to go. You don't want the system to get past the point of incipient cavitation because the after that, cavitation will occur. So your design limit is setting the two equal to each other. Okay, so here's an example that illustrates uh, a situation where you maybe would need to assess the risk of cavitation. This is relatively warm water, so what that means, it, the warm water has a higher vapor pressure, and that's what makes it more risky for us is that here the vapor pressure term is one of the things that's reducing how much available suction head we've got. It's your available suction head starts with atmospheric pressure. So let's just assume that this system is at uh, sea level and so our atmospheric pressure is 101.325 pascals. If you're above sea level, let's say if you're designing the system in Denver, Colorado, then they have an increased risk of cavitation as well because there would be less um, atmospheric pressure head to begin with. But let's just assume that this is at sea level. So I'm going to pause for a moment and in this system it, the pump requires 3.5 meters of net positive suction head. So that's the NPSHR is 3.5 meters. So how much is available? From the diagram you're going to be able to get the delta Z sub S you are given the suction side head loss. You, know, you could maybe have to calculate that with the Moody 
diagram and the Darcy Wiesbach equation and so on, but this is just given for this first uh, look at the cavitation example. So I'm going to put you into the breakout rooms for a moment and give you a chance to determine yes, will cavitation occur or no, there won't be cavitation. Following. Still working? Not done yet? Uh, just about there. All right, I'll give you another minute. All right, this system is not going to cavitate. Let me bring the uh, calculations up here on the screen. All right, so the available NPSH starts with the atmospheric head, and so our standard atmospheric pressure in absolute terms, 101.325 pascals, and then the unit weight of water, and we were given the temperature and so therefore we can have a, a specific unit weight that accompanies that temperature. Okay, so we start off with, I should have written the component uh, lengths there. So what's the uh, 101325 divided by 9732? So we've got about 10.4 meters of head. That's our starting budget, so to speak. You've got 10.4 meters of head here, and then all of these three terms afterwards are going to be deducting against that. And what we want to see is whether or not what's left is more than 3.5. So we're starting with 10.4 meters of head, and we have to have 3.5 to avoid cavitation. So um, the uh, elevation difference is 4.3 meters, so it's 4.3 meters, and the, the, uh, what determines the delta ZS is just the elevation difference between the pump and the water surface. It's not the elevation difference between the downstream tank and the upstream tank. So it doesn't matter so much, well, at all, what's happening after the pump. It matters what's happening until the pump. Okay, so we just use the 4.3 for the delta ZS, and then 1.6 for the head loss, and then finally the uh, vapor pressure term here. We got the vapor pressure divided by the unit weight of water. So there's 3.761, and since that's more than what's required, the available is 3.76, the required was 3.7, was it 5? 3.5 meters of head, so no cavitation will occur in this system. All right, so that is cavitation. Now, let's talk a little bit more about pump operations and finding the, uh, what will the flow rate be when you set together a certain pump and a certain system. Now remember, uh, what was introduced in the lecture from Friday is that you can get a pump curve from the manufacturer of the pump or the person who's marketing it. And sometimes it'll be given as an equation, sometimes it's given as a figure, um, but in this case what we have is a certain pump and what we know is that it has a cutoff head of 18 meters and so that means it, it simply cannot lift water any higher than 18 meters. So that's the maximum delta Z that this pump could achieve 18 meters, so that's the intercept here. And then um, this second term here reduces the amount of head that's being added for every unit increase in the flow rate. So it can add a maximum of 18 meters of head if the flow rate is zero, but then as you increase the flow rate, it's adding progressively less and less head to the system. Okay. 
So the idea with these pump operations is set the pump curve equal to the system curve. Now we don't yet have a system curve, but we have a diagram that illustrates that, uh, for example, we have an inlet K value here, and we know the pipe, uh, the total pipe length is 135 meters, and so that includes like this horizontal distance, the distance that's submerged into the um, down into the tank, and it also includes this delta, the delta Z, the height difference of the system. Um, we know the F value, that's given directly, but of course in a real scenario when you're finding what's the flow rate, you'd have to kind of iterate this first of all with an assumed F value, and then you'd need to update your F value once you found the flow rate and see if the, uh, the initial assumption was correct. Just to simplify things a bit here, let's start and uh, stick with a fixed F value of 0 0.021. The diameter of the pipe is given because we're going to need to account for the frictional losses, and of course the Darcy-Wiesbach equation has D as one of its terms. But the, uh, the second part of this, once we determine the flow rate, so that's going to work into question A. You know, Solving for the operating point will tell you the flow rate, and then this is asking how long will it take to pump one metric ton of water. Does anybody know how much is a metric ton? You know, uh, a standard ton that we think of in traditional units is 2,000 pounds, but what about a metric ton? Any guesses? Isn't it 1,000 kilograms? Very good. That's exactly right, Luke. So it's 1,000 kilograms. So what Part A is asking is, once you find the flow rate, then calculate the time it takes to pump essentially a thousand liters of water. And what we're going to assume is that the elevation difference doesn't change. Assume that this tank is big enough, tank A, that the water level isn't going down. And so the, the delta Z that you're going to put into the energy equation is going to be a constant 12 meter elevation difference. Okay, so part B is just saying let's account for uh, the efficiency of the pump, the efficiency of the motor, and try and determine with the power equation how much power in terms of watts is required to operate this pump. You know, at the, at the operating point that it's going at, we're going to know the Q, the flow rate, and so that's one of the terms that determines the, uh, the electricity that's required. And then also we know the unit weight of this water. We're just assuming it's standard 9810 typical unit weight. But then you're going to be solving for the pump head. So once you know the flow rate from setting the pump curve equal to the system curve, you can also back calculate for the, uh, the pump head that's being added. And so H sub P is going to be one of the things that you can determine when you solve the operating point. Okay, so the way that these questions begin is substitute everything you can into the energy equation. So you're, you're pumping the water from, here is location one, the interface of the air and the water in the tank. So this is location one, and location two is here, this jet of water that's coming out. So you can cancel out P1 and Z1 uh, and V1, but uh, P2 can be canceled because it's jetting to the atmosphere. But you should keep V2. At least I hope that's what I did. Oh, I don't want to show you the solution yet. I hope that that's what I did when I was solving the solution was not necessarily cancel out the V2. Let's see, what did I do it? Yes, I left it in there. That's good. All right. Um, now, we've seen a certain substitution before for um, velocity head. Remember that V squared divided by 2G is the same as uh, Q squared divided by 2G a squared. 
And let me sh remind you where we saw that formula before. Here it is, system curve. So let me copy this and paste it onto this new example that we're working today. What you need to do is, not paste. All right. Here's the energy equation. Rewrite the energy equation this way. Rewrite the energy equation so that it looks like this. So here's the starting energy equation. This is what you want the energy equation to look like so that you can set it equal to this pump curve. So this is given. This will be on one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation is going to be delta Z plus Q times all of these terms. And so here's our only K value. You know the F. You know the pipe length. So here is the system curve that you need to determine, set the two equal to each other, and solve for Q. All right, I'm going to shove you back into those breakout rooms so that you can collaborate and ask questions of each other. Uh, you're going to be in there for 12, 13 minutes. I'll come in and see if there's any questions I can address. And of course, if, if something comes up, feel free to ask your question in the chat bar as well. But then after that, we'll take a look at the solution together. And I also want to give you a hint on the homework. So we'll spend a little bit of time after this example going over that homework hint. All right, so now to the breakout rooms. So uh, the way that you solve this is you set the system curve equal to the pump curve. So that means the right-hand side of the pump curve is going to be equal to the right-hand side of this system curve. And so the system curve is just the energy equation that's been rearranged to solve for h sub p. So let me show you the solution. And hopefully you were thinking of this the correct way, even if you didn't go through all the calculations themselves. Um, so here we have a little system. I've tried to reproduce the sketch. But um, here is the energy equation. And what I'm saying is the pressure at 1 is 0 because it's an open tank. The pressure at 2 is 0 because it's a jet of water. We're just going to say that Z1 is 0, and then Z2 is 12 meters above that. So let's just double check and see that that's consistent with the sketch. So we're saying our elevation datum is at the liquid surface A, and then location 2 is 12 meters above that. V1 is 0, but V2 isn't 0 because it's a moving jet of water. Uh, there is no turbine in the system, but there is a pump. There are friction losses and also local losses. So rearranging this energy equation, now I've rearranged it in terms of H sub P. And here's what I've got. I've got the elevation difference of 12 meters, and then the velocity head. And instead of having the velocity head in terms of v squared divided by 2g, I've got q squared divided by 2g a squared. So that's the same thing as the velocity head at 2. And then the local losses term, so h naught is k times q squared divided by 2g a squared. And then here's the friction loss terms, f l q squared divided by d 2g a squared. Okay, so here is the system curve where the velocity head is just going to be 1 and the k value is going to be 1. So I factored out the q squared divided by 2g a squared before the brackets there. And uh, so our system curve is 12, so that's the elevation difference, plus 282.1 times q squared. So that's just when you have all of these terms and then divide it by 2g a squared. So this is our system curve. And the way that you solve pump operations is set the system curve equal to the pump curve. So 18 minus 5.6 q squared is the pump curve. And I've set that equal to the system curve. And so when I simplify and solve for q, the flow rate should be 
point one four four cubic meters per second. So that means it's pumping 144 kilograms per second. If you put that same flow rate back into the pump equation, then you'll get that the pump head being added is 17.85 meters. So here I've done that time calculation where it was asking for a metric ton. How long would it take to pump a metric ton? Well, if it's doing 144 kilograms per second, then that means it should take 6.7 seconds in order to pump that entire ton. If this all seems really unfamiliar, then reviewing the recorded lecture from last Friday may help to clarify some of this. All right, now what about the electricity part of this, where it's asking you know, how much power will be consumed in watts? So here's the power equation. The power equation says multiply the flow rate by the unit weight times h sub p. And that is ideally how much power is required. But then we have to divide by the efficiency factor because we have to put in more electricity than that ideal case. And so here's the overall power equation where we're accounting for the uh, efficiency of both the motor and the pump. So it's kind of a cumulative efficiency situation where you have to multiply the two efficiency factors together to find out when working in unison what's the overall efficiency. So this is going to require 48.5 kilowatts in order to do the work of adding 17.85 meters of head and having uh, 144 liters per second flowing through the system. So that's the uh, the process in a nutshell. Set the pump curve equal to the system curve and solve for Q. All right, so I mentioned I wanted to give you a little bit of a uh, leg up on one of the homework problems that goes with pumps, and this is the one. You're given a figure in problem 9.24. They already are giving you the uh, system curve in the problem statement. So in this homework problem, they're telling you H equals 30 plus 2 Q squared. That's the system curve. But what you have to do is generate the pump curve from the figure that's provided. And so you have to, in essence, digitize it so that you can get an equation from the curve. And so what I'm suggesting you do is, like with your pencil, draw the, um, the x value and the corresponding y value for this pump curve. Create a table. So for instance, when the flow rate is 0, the pump head is 200. When the flow rate is 20, then the total head being added is 150. So do the same thing when you have a flow rate of 10 and 15 and 25 and so on. And so for each of these different operating points, you can find out the difference between the known and the calculated pump heads. And so um, estimate a C value and then you'll have a predicted pump head and you want to minimize the difference. So you're going to try and figure out what is the C value in, the, in this uh, pump curve that you're going to be synthesizing so that then you can set that pump curve equal to the system curve that's given in the problem statement. So this is just kind of a numerical method where you're going to be playing around with lots of different values for C to come up with the lowest average difference in the figure. So like for example if C is 0.1 then what would that curve look like? So you can actually draw it and see does, does the pump curve look like what you're given if C is 0.1? What about 0.2 or 0.3? So essentially you try and come up with a curve that looks like the one that's given in the book and the way that you know if it is a correct C value is just whatever C value gives you the smallest difference between what is predicted by the equation for H sub P and what you can actually know by measuring it with your pencil and the paper. All right, So hopefully uh, that'll make sense as you read through it and start thinking about that problem a little bit further. That's all the time that we have for today. Again, if this pump operations example was just uh, really unfamiliar, then I'd suggest you take a look at the example from Friday's class because we did a similar thing there of uh, 
determining the operating point by looking at a pump curve and a system curve on that example. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, the things that are on your plate in this course is the homework assignment and the exam, both of which uh, are going to happen on Monday the 8th. Hope you have a great day, everybody. Feel free to uh, send me an email or give me a call on Teams if you've got any questions. Take care.